Will here, N5OLA. And this is a Heathkit HW101 that I just got from eBay. I'm gonna open this up, go from start to finish, and see what it takes to get it on the air. Well, happy to report the cabinet is in really nice shape. Looks good, front panel's nice. Jackson Drive turns. Let's open it up. There's mold on the bottom and the screw heads are rusty. The phono jack uh, ground contacts on the outside, those are rusty. That tells me this has probably been sitting in someone's garage, not in a temperature controlled environment. I don't know if I'm gonna like what's inside. Let's see. Didn't come with feet, which is unfortunate, but I've got feet. I can fix that. It's not as bad as I thought. You can see the calibrator crystal is all coated with tarnish. This shaft is pitted with green tarnish and even the, uh, the inside of the pulleys. Look how bright green they are. These wire wound resistors were mounted upside down. I don't guess that's a big problem. I can fix that. And of course, I'm gonna to wanna to remove any paper caps. One interesting finding, this plastic dial looks almost brand new. There's no yellowing at all. I think somebody maybe 10 years ago or so decided to fix it up a little bit and then gave up. I don't know. Really happy to see that it has a CW filter. These are becoming very hard to find. Look at all this rust. So I see that the wafer switches under the switchboard cover are okay. They're not bad. You see a little bit of tarnish, especially on the end here, but not bad, not anything like this one. So the first thing I wanna do is fire this baby up, but I'm not gonna do that without cleaning all the wafer switches first. Make sure we've got good contacts. I'm gonna go through later and deal with that corrosion. Question is, why are all the tubes cold? We don't have any filament voltage at all going to them. Filament voltage comes in from pin four of the 11 pin socket, goes right to V2, where it daisy chains throughout all the tubes. So I'm gonna check V2. If there's no voltage there, then we know the problem is in the socket. This brown and white wire provides the filament voltage to all the tubes. It goes from here to right there, this brown and white wire. Checking it, I'm not seeing anything. That tells me it's just a problem right there at the socket. And so I'm just gonna see if we have a basic problem just getting a connection. Well, there we go. It's all it took. So I'm going to open up that socket and see why we're not getting a good connection. Yep, way too much corrosion on that 11 pin socket. And just look at that one. Look at the inside. And for this, let's try some of this. And here we go, quite a difference. I was cleaning up in this area and I noticed something interesting. Look at the difference between this part that I cleaned and this part that's not cleaned. That's nicotine. Okay, let's fire it up again. That's filament voltage. Those uh, lamps come off of the filament string. There we go. Yeah, it's just gonna need a lot of cleaning. I'm gonna go through and check all the resistors. But uh, we see now that uh, the tubes are lighting up. That's good. 
We've got some kind of response. I even hear some signal coming through. Let's get to work. With the knobs off, you really do get a sense of how much nicotine is on this rig, but that's not a big deal. We're gonna wash that off. First, I'm gonna pull all the knobs. Now, all the tubes. These belts are in bad condition. Let's pull them. Just remove the back panel. And look at the condition of those finals. Both of them are in bad shape. And on this one, I pulled off the anode cap. Mm, sad. I think I know how to get that back on though. There's really no two ways about it. This radio needs a sink scrub. We want to get all the dust and grit, the nicotine, the tarnish, resin, all the crap. We just want to get it out. This is just standard garden variety dish soap. I'm going to go through with progressively smaller brushes. I get all the grit out. I do know that I'm going to want to spend some time on that tarnish, like the tarnish on this calibrator crystal. But before that, I want it to be clean, as clean as possible. So I can still see the cloudy nicotine stains on the front, even after scrubbing it with a brush. One thing that's really good for that, this stuff. Look at that. I don't know if you can tell the difference. This side's clean, that side's not. Whole lot better. Anywhere I see blue brass, I'm gonna give it a scrub with this toothbrush. The secret here is to get it thoroughly rinsed and then thoroughly dried. There's really no harm in doing this as long as you don't power it up while it's still wet. And we're gonna give this some time in the oven and then some time in front of a heat lamp Really want to make sure it gets dry. But already you can see the difference. Wow. And of course, same deal with the underside. And there she goes in the oven, 170 degrees. I'm going to leave it in for 20 minutes. Turn off the heat, leave it in for another 20. So here we are. All nice and dry. Look at those boards. Wow. Wow, so clean. Not too happy with this tuning shaft. Not happy with uh, these pulleys. They're gonna have to come off, but that's easy. And then I'll have to clean these up. And uh, I think right now what I'm gonna do is just go through and start testing all the resistors. These are carbon, composite resistors. They do have a tendency to uh, go up in value as they age, especially when they've been subjected to heat, uh, especially right here in the audio board. I usually have to swap out a lot of those. So what I'm going to do is test all my resistors and anything that's over 15% too high. I'm going to pull them. For each circuit board, I've got one of these little resistance cheat sheets that I made up from the manual. It just makes it a lot faster. So I'm going to go one by one, check them off, indicate any that need to be pulled, and I'm going to do that for each board. By the way, these should be linked to this video description. Okay, I've identified seven or eight problem resistors and I'm going to go through and replace them. I'm going to cross-reference the x-ray view 
to find where the traces are for each particular resistor. I'm gonna take my dental pick, put it on that side, loop it under the lead, flip the rig around on my Lazy Susan, heat up the pad and pull it out. Okay, about an hour and a half later, all resistors checked, new capacitors here, here, uh, there's one tucked away there, one there, and then all these blue ones that you see are new. This is the RF board. There are switch boards on the other side, so you have to solder them to the top of the board. It's ugly, but there's really no other way. And then um, right in here, those four blue diodes, those are in the balanced modulator circuit. Those replace the original germaniums, which uh, have a tendency to fail. And if they haven't failed yet, they will someday. And so I pull them. Replaced a mylar here, electrolytic here. And I, uh, I had to pull, see that blue resistor tucked in there? I had to pull that mylar to get to it. I don't like replacing old components and so I put in a new one but I put it in on the underside where it would have a little more room to express itself. We have some active rust here on the band switch shaft and uh, on uh, these two shafts holding the wafer switch. I don't like that so here's what I'm going to do with it. I've got some OSFO which will kill the rust and I'm just gonna very carefully apply it with a Q-tip prior to sanding, because I really wanna reverse that uh, process so the rust doesn't come back. There's what it looks like just two minutes later. That rust is already disappearing. I'm gonna go in and when it dries, sand it. Then you can hit it with a Dremel or just a little piece of sandpaper, move it up and down a bit to get all the old rust off of there. I've got two wafer switches with quite a bit of corrosion on them or tarnish. So I'm going to get that toothbrush out again, get the Brasso after it uh, very lightly. It doesn't take a whole lot. Quite a bit better. Still a little bit of blue in the rivets, but uh, I think the contacts are clean now. You can get manic trying to make these things pristine. What I want to do really is just uh, stop the tarnish where I can. Um, and I think once this rig is in a controlled environment, it's not going to come back. Interesting. This side of the rig has no rust at all. I wonder why. I don't want to remove these two pre-selector capacitors, but I do want to get that rust out of there. So let's uh, bring back the Q-tip and some OSFO. I also want to put some on this shaft to just stop that oxidation process. These pulleys unscrew quite easily, so I will pull them out and clean them individually. This 100 kilohertz oscillator crystal, really easy to remove. Just, uh, just two leads right there, heat them up, pull it out polish it. With that crystal out, we're now able to access the screw on this pulley. It's the only way to get to it. Okay, so this uh, brass shaft is looking great. This uh, pre-selector shaft looking a whole lot better. My pulleys are nice and clean. Is it museum quality? No, but it's a whole lot cleaner. It's also important to clean this inner shaft and then put a little drop of three-in-one oil inside the brass shaft so that the inner shaft turns nice and smooth. Okay, now the shafts are clean. They're replaced. The pulleys look nice now. I've got the belts in. These are fatter than the usual belts that you see here, but I like them. They, they really fill that pulley and they, um, they've got more bite to them. Could not get 
one of the fat belts on this one because the pulley is just too close to the board and it grabs. Also got the knobs cleaned up and installed and uh, getting close to the point where we're going to put some tubes in and see what happens. If your rig has one of these resistors running from the bandpass board to the IF board, take it out, replace it with the jumper that's in the service bulletins. Mustn't forget to reinstall the calibrator crystal. Look how pretty that is. Okay, I pulled out the three modulator board crystals here, here, and here. They're very easy to pull. They look really bad. They don't fit the overall look that we're going for here. So let's clean them up. For this job, a really fine grade of sandpaper can do wonders. And those shiny crystals. Time now to test all the tubes on the tube checker. Hit them all with contact cleaner and scrub them with a toothbrush. Some of the pins are so crusty, I can't even get a reading. There we go. Yeah, we really gotta clean those pins. So I cleaned all the contacts and I got a clean cloth and some Windex and just shined up the tubes. I gotta be careful not to uh, wipe off any of the identifying information. Tubes are all in place. Rig is clean. The belts are in place. That is a really nice looking transceiver. The dial is not all yellow. The faceplate is perfect. And I installed some new hardware here and I cleaned out these switches with sprayed them out with contact cleaner. So they move freely now. Oh, I just realized I want to replace these two screws as well. There's a lot of rusty hardware on this thing, but uh, little by little, we're getting rid of it. Anyway, let's see what happens. There's that uh, voltage regulator. Maybe uh, I just need to replace that tube. I don't know. All right. At this point, we're probably going to have some tubes that may not be properly seated. So I'm just going to seat everything in the receiver circuit. Make sure it's getting a good contact. Okay, getting a little audio, getting a little crackle, but not a lot. There's also the possibility that I did something wrong when I was installing all those components. It happens. It happens more often than I'd like to admit. Well, meanwhile, back at the voltage regulator, it has gone cold. So that was a bad tube. Thankfully, I have about 10 million of these. Something's wrong with these wire wound resistors here. This one should be 1000 ohms. Let's see what it tests. Okay, let's check the other one. Oh, <laughs> this one should be 2.5K. It's 7.6 megs. Oh boy, I'm gonna replace them both. I have a lot of trouble with these old wire wound resistors. I would say about a third of the time they go out at some point during the restoration, and I don't know why. Tested them out of circuit. This one is open. This one is now testing 21 megs. So, wow. I may just have to start replacing these with every rest restoration as a matter of course. I don't know. They're very undependable. So for the replacements, I'm bringing out the big guns. These are 10 watts, not seven. These will hold up better to heat and they get very, very hot right here. So um, they'll last longer. And they're brand new, so I know they're going to work. Okay, let's power up. Three, two, one. Let's see if we have a calibrator. That's good. No meter response. That's bad. But, uh, okay. At this point, I'm just going to leave it on for a while. And let it work out its kinks. Maybe there's a little moisture in the system somewhere. 
It's about five minutes later and I do have some signal coming through. It's faint, but it's there. Okay, it is the next day. I fired this rig up and yesterday when I turned the RF gain counterclockwise, nothing happened. Today, it's def the meter's deflecting fine. That's good. I've got a uh, much better volume. But I don't have any signal indication on the meter at all. It's just slamming hard below zero. So I need to look at the ALC circuit and possibly the AVC. ALC is automatic level control, AVC automatic volume control. The two work together and uh, something's wrong. I need to check. Another problem is when I get the, the volume control to a certain point, I've got a, could just be some grit in the potentiometer. I need to spray it out and see if I can fix that. Otherwise, I'm going to have to replace it. And then tuning, when I get to a certain point, it just stops. So I may have to remove the VFO. I usually do just to open it up and clean it. But I have to say, that's encouraging. Okay, the new pot is installed. Here's the old one. Working as it should. So I'm grateful <clears throat> to have an AF gain pot that works now, but I feel like my maximum volume is not what it should be because I know how loud these things can get. That's maximum. Okay, I'm gonna swap out V13 and see if I get more volume. Okay, I got rid of the old two V13. This is the new one. Wow, it's loud. Okay, but why is that loudness not showing up on my meter? Well, I'm suspecting it's something in the metering circuit right there. So I'm going to go, I've already checked those resistors, but I'm going to check them again. That 100K right there. I'm going to look at that one particularly. Okay, I went ahead and replaced this 100K resistor. And I replaced it, it was a 1 watt, I replaced it with that 2 watt resistor. Um, that particular circuit is extremely sensitive and it will fluctuate depending on how hot that resistor is. So that two watt resistor is gonna take more heat and give me a better reading. So I've got a reading on the meter now. And what's funny is that 100K resistor tested just fine. There was nothing wrong with it. And yet somehow replacing it got my signal showing up on the meter. However, I should have an S9 right there and I don't. And instead of going to zero, it's going to sub-zero. I'm trying to adjust the um, zero adjust potentiometer. And I can actually hear it in the speaker as I turn this, which means I've got some grit in there. I'm gonna spray out all of these controls. Okay, I'm now able to zero out the meter in ALC mode, that's good. Let's see what kind of... That's pretty close, but I should be getting an S9. Why am I only getting an S6? This rig has not yet been aligned. We're getting close to S9. I think that once I put it through the alignment process, I'm gonna get more output. So I'm gonna leave that problem and move on. I think the next thing I want to address is this tuning. See how it's stuck here? I'm gonna take the VFL apart, look inside, clean it, Given all of the oxidation and so forth we found on the outside, God knows what's going to be inside. And we got to do something about this tuning. Pulling the VFO is a lot easier than it seems. Seems kind of scary, but you really just have to desolder those three wires, pull this coax. There are two set screws on that shaft right in there. Remove the knob and then remove these two screws. And then these two nuts, which are easy, 
these two nuts down here, which are hard. You got to have one of these. I'm going to be very careful not to bust that dial. Although, as I said, that looks like a new dial. Normally they are yellow and very fragile. Looks pretty good, although I see some mods that I want to do. I want to ground this uh, variable capacitor housing to the wall of the VFO, and then I want to glue this capacitor to the wall. That's one of the modifications in the service bulletin that's recommended. I'm also going to give it a good spraying out, but I tell you what, I don't see any corrosion in there, no oxidation. I'm going to test those resistors too. I found that this resistor is 45% above tolerance. I don't like that. So I took the whole VFO apart. Oh, what a mess. And I'm uh, going to replace that one resistor. That's good, though. It gives me a chance to go through here and, you know, spray out these uh, crusty bearings. And uh, it's, it's worth it. Fun fact, the new resistors are not as long as the old resistors. So I'm leaving part of the lead here. I'm going to take that sleeve off and I'll just tap into that and then solder it to the bottom of this tuning coil. Okay, and there's the final product. That's a ground strap. <clears throat> it's referenced in the Heathkit service manuals as a way to improve tuning stability uh, by providing a better ground contact for that variable capacitor. And then gluing down that ceramic capacitor. That's also recommended. Will it make a difference? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, I got the VFO mounted. And the hard part are these four screws. Well, these two screws are easy. As I said, these two are hard and you've got to have one of these Heathkit nut drivers or something like it <clears throat> to get that nut down in there. Because it's, uh, it's really hard to get to and you do have to move stuff around. I find that sometimes these, uh, this bundle of wires here, sometimes the bundle is, is right in front of that screw. And so to get to it, I have to cut through this thread that's holding the bundle together and flatten out the wires. But whatever it takes, you got to get all four of these nuts in or else it's not going to be properly grounded. When reattaching the VFO, the order of operations is get these guys tight first, then the set screws on the shaft, and then work on these four holding the VFO to the chassis. If you do it the other way around, this Jackson drive is not going to line up correctly with the one on the VFO, and your tuning's going to be weird. And finally, if everything is as it should be, you should have smooth, buttery tuning with no catches. If you're tuning and it just it grabs and you turn the knob and the numbers don't change, you've got a problem. It could be that uh, this is on too tight and the screw is projecting through this plate and rubbing up against a screw on the Jackson drive. Or it could be something like the dial is rubbing up against that nut. Or sometimes you'll have uh, the plastic dial rubbing up against that wire harness under there. So just check for clearance. Make sure everything's clear and it's turning smoothly. I have one complaint about this radio. The receiver doesn't seem to be very sensitive. Here, listen to this signal on, and then compare it to this rig. Look at that difference. Okay, I found something. I just installed this resistor because the one that was there before was partially burned up. It was still getting current through it, but you see on the board that black strip. Uh, at some point, there was a short on this board and it uh, burned up that resistor, so I replaced it. I think what happened was this 
pin on the wafer switch may have been up and it touched the switchboard cover when it was put in place and then they powered it up and then it shorted out and burned up that resistor, at least partially. If it was completely burned up, we would have no signal at all going through there. Okay, here's another problem. Watch this. Turn the volume all the way down. Can you hear that hum? Experience tells me that is probably poor grounding of the audio board. Okay, what I did was I loosened up all the screws around the audio board. So I've got it loose. So what I want to do is I want to hit the foil under the board with contact cleaner. And I've got some 400 grade sandpaper. And what I want to do is just get it under there and uh, try to clean up the copper, get any grit out of there, and then tighten these screws and see if I've got an improvement. And for the parts of the board I can't get to from the top, I'm gonna to go in here under the bottom and just uh, shoot it right through there. Okay, those screws are all tightened down. Now I'm gonna go through all the boards and make sure they're all screwed down nice and tight. And that took care of it, hum is gone. If the hum gets louder as you turn it up, that means it's uh, past the audio board somewhere else in the receiver circuit. Well, stop the presses. I had to tear this rig apart. Take a look at these pictures. Do you see the driver grid board and the driver plate board? Those boards are backwards. And that's why I have not been able to align the bands. I have output on 80 meters and 20 meters, but not 40. And so these two boards had to come out and I got to put them all back in. However, it gives me a chance to replace some rusty crap like this comb bracket. It's bad. And these switchboard shields, I mean, they're a mess. So I'm putting in clean new shields and I think maybe overall this is just going to help the grounding of these boards, which is so important. If these boards aren't properly grounded, you get all kinds of uh, stray oscillation and bad alignment problems and stuff. So this is the new comb bracket, nice and clean. It's gonna take me about two hours to do this whole thing, but it's gotta be done. This rig was built 40, 45 years ago, and it has never worked correctly because those two boards were in the wrong place. Well, got the boards back in place, and I would say, for me, that's the equivalent of open heart surgery. I really don't like having to take these out because once you take them out and then you put them back, invariably something does not co connect properly. That was the case here, but it was my fault. There are two wires close together that go to the RF board those two right there, they were touching and I was getting no output on most of the bands. So found it, fixed it, and it's done. So let's check the output. There's 80 meters, close to 120. There's 40 meters. Getting about 90 watts on 40. That one's a little shy. It's not uncommon on these rigs. Let's go to 20, there's 100 watts. 15, there's 100. And finally 10 meters, 10 meters is a little low on these rigs. It's about uh, 75 or 80. And there we go. Well, this is probably the third time I thought I was done and got the cabinet on, found out there was a problem, I had to take the cabinet back off again. This is what's happening. I'm turning on the AF gain switch and you can hear the relay click. Why is the relay clicking? So I think it's the uh, transmit receive relay. Let's go check it out. By the way, I popped off the top on that relay and it is really hot. Okay, that's the underside of the relay. Just turn it back on. 
it's still clicking. Okay, I found it. This diode lead was in contact with this capacitor lead. They are not supposed to touch and they were touching because it got mashed. I have aligned the rig. I've neutralized the finals. I've done the carrier null adjustment and I'm going to put it on the air and see what kind of reports I get. Yeah, Mike, WW0Y, N5OLA. Uh, very good. Um, I just uh, wanted to point out, I am running a Heathkit HW101 transceiver that I just restored. You are my first contact. And uh, would you mind giving me a little signal analysis? How's my uh, audio quality? Well, there she is. Cabinet looks good. I'd give that cabinet a, give it an A, A minus. It's got a few little scuffs here and there. You really can't avoid that. I try not to uh, do too much touch up painting. Nothing you can do for scratches except to just repaint the whole thing. And I do have paint available for that, but I try not to do that unless it's really called for. I think some of these scratches, you know, they're just, uh, part of the rig's history and I'll leave them. But anyway, got a, got a good sounding rig. It performs well. What did we learn on this rig? Well, we learned don't judge a book by its cover. This one looked easy. I thought it was just going to be a matter of cleaning off the nicotine and aligning and replacing some resistors. And it turned out to be a little more complicated with that driver grid and driver plate board reversed um and i wish i had noticed that earlier but anyway it's fun and this was a rig that really repaid the effort it's really clean it's got good uh, output and it was the kind of rig i would keep if i didn't already have quite a few already but yeah let's find her a good home thank you for watching 73